¿Sabían que detrás de lo que consumimos hay un gasto de agua? Eso es la huella hídrica. Por ejemplo, para que nos podamos tomar un café, en su producción se invierte la misma cantidad de agua que en una ducha. Es decir, el agua llega a los hogares a través del grifo, pero también de la cesta de la compra. Y en muchas ocasiones procede de lugares afectados por fuertes sequías. Nos lo cuenta Ruth Matthews, directora ejecutiva de Water Footprint Network. Muy buenos días, estamos con Ruth Matthews. Eh, directora de Footprints eh, Network, Water Footprints Network. Nos gustaría saber cuáles son las principales líneas de trabajo de, de, de esta institución. The Water Footprint Network has been founded to help bring the work of water footprint assessment to the world. And so there are researchers who are studying the best ways to use water footprint. But what we want to do is actually allow it into the world so that it makes a difference. And so some of the things that we're doing is that we uh, work with other organizations from businesses and companies, uh, investors, international organizations, um, NGOs, to help them with understanding the way that we use water and the impact that that has. And so when we're thinking about the water footprint, what we're thinking about is the pressure that we put on water resources. So you can imagine a footprint uh, on sand, it's the same thing. What we're, what we're measuring is how much pressure we're putting on water resources. And so if I'm thinking about my own water footprint, then I'd be thinking about all of the things that I consume. The clothing that I wear, the food that I eat, uh, the um, computers I own, all of those things. And they all have water behind them. And so what we're doing is helping everybody understand the water behind the products that we consume. Mm -hmm. And we're working with companies and governments to help make sure that water is managed in a way that is within sustainable limits, is shared fairly amongst different people, uh, and that it's being used to the best uh, that it can be used for, that as productively as it can be, because we only have a small amount that we're able to use. It's, yes, the water footprint is, is not as well known as the carbon footprint is, and that's one of the things that we're doing, is, is raising awareness around it. And I go all over the world in developing and developed countries, and very rarely does anybody recognize that there's water in the clothing that we wear. It doesn't feel wet, but there's water there. And that's what we need to understand, because if we are using things that have water in them, in the production of them, then that means that we have a relationship with the water resources where that production happened. Yes, how much water am I wearing? And yet most of it is not going to be coming from where I am. And so it's very good for us to conserve water at home at, in terms of the tap water that we're using. But it's more important to understand our relationship with water outside of our home, through the food, through clothing, through other goods. And that that happens perhaps in places far from where we are, and maybe in places where there is overpopulation, there isn't good governance, there isn't good laws and regulations. And, and so the water is not being used in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And so what I see is that when we look at agriculture and the volume of water that's used for agriculture, the water footprint of agriculture is the, is the largest, um, what I see is opportunity because there's a lot of inefficiency and there's a lot of growth in technology, there's a lot of learning, there's a lot of capacity building that can make farmers more uh, responsible in the way that they use water. Yeah, there are challenges with this because we are in a situation where we are using too much water in a lot of places and we're also emitting a lot of pollution. The water quality is, is really poor in many places and especially in developing countries. Mm. And, and there's a challenge of we want people to have better lives. We want economic development to support 
the ending of hunger, the reduction of poverty, the, you know, more educational opportunities, all of these things. We want these things, but somehow the way we're doing it is, is not sustainable. It's not working. And so it really is about fundamentally changing how we live in the world, how we see ourselves as a part of the planet, how we recognize that we can't ask more than it's able to give. And, and that's the challenge is that we haven't been thinking that way. We've been thinking a bit like you are when you're a young child. There's plenty, mm -hmm. there's no limits, but there are limits. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to learn how to live respectfully in those limits. Mm -hmm. In a way, it already is. If you think about the hydrologic cycle, there's only so much water in the planet and it, it moves. We use it and then it, then it comes back. There's evaporation and then it comes as rainfall someplace else. And so it is already a circular, a circular system. Think about water in terms of um, minimizing the amount that we take from places that we can't return it to, for instance in groundwater. And when we're using water, we need to be thinking about not only how little we can use or how little we can, um, can pollute it, but also in the ways that we use it and in the materials that get into water, how we can recapture those and bring those back into use in another way. So what I like about the circular economy is that it, it goes back to what I was saying of we need to completely rethink about how we live within the, the, the scope of the planet that we have, the resources that we have. And the circular economy is built around the idea that we only have so much, so how can we use that so much that we have again and again and again without diminishing its quality. Mm -hmm.